Not a place I have to hide in. Life's not worth a damn till you can say I am what I am. I'm joined this morning by a very welcome guest, which is Sandra Collins. Now, Sandra is a uh, director of the National Library, one of the great treasures down there in Kildare Street. So, Sandra, welcome to LGBTQ Life. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Delighted to be here. Yeah. Sandra, can I just ask you a little bit about the uh, history of the National Library itself? We were just briefly uh, referring to it. I, st I think it's one of the, you know, we're a republic, but if we had a crown, I think that would be one of the jewels of the crown. Not many people actually uh, like the Senate. You know, it's an exclusive uh, uh, commodity. It's an absolutely fabulous building. Although it's full of knowledge and all of that, I almost consider it a meditative center. Uh, what's the history of it? Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thanks, Michael. So um, we think it's great as well. Yeah. Um, so we were um, established in 1877 and um, uh, made to record the history of Ireland, the story of Ireland. And we collect um, largely paper based material. So um, letters, diaries, um, books, periodicals, magazines. Um, you'd be amazed at the breadth of the collections in the library. So we've a copy of every single newspaper published from the smallest parish to the nationals. They're all kept safe. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, amazing manuscript material like the um, the entire um, uh, archive of WB Yeats or Seamus Heaney. Um, so really, I always think we're something for everyone. So there's mm -hmm. family history um, and the diversity of Irish life. That's really important to us as well. So to have have something that speaks to everybody's experience of what it means to be Irish, to live in Ireland, to be connected to Ireland. Mm -hmm. So dare I say it, it's a legacy of empire. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we pre-exist and um, we predate the foundation of our state for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, I suppose national libraries are um, like every country would have one. They're a unique um, repository for the memory of that state. So um, it's really important that Ireland has one, the Republic has one, mm -hmm. um, and uh, capturing that um, legacy of Ireland um, um, uh, from before we were our own country to up to the modern day, um, that's 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 really important. Yep. And our building, then, as you were saying, um, uh, we adjoin the Dáil, Dáil Éireann, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we used to have a beautiful rolling open um, green uh, between the National Museum, Dáil Éireann, and the National Library. Um, and now there's uh, gates um, around the Dáil, uh, mm -hmm. you know, security measures and so on. Um, but um, but we love our buildings. Like they're just yeah. um, such a part of. Uh, the identity of the organization mm -hmm. but something we like to think about is um do do these beautiful historical you know um, victorian buildings um uh, give a sense of um uh, like do they turn some people away because what we would like is everybody to feel welcome through the doors everybody to think well you know my memories are included in the national library and now i want to go through those doors and engage with them see an exhibition have a couple coffee actually open the manuscripts the books in the reading room so um yeah it's something it's something yeah, about uh, it, it's interesting you should say about how perhaps the buildings alienate some people because about 100 meters away uh, there's one of the most iconic images uh, which is the monkeys playing billiards <laughs> um, yes. um, and you say that to people and very few of them know about it and yet when you point it out it's just one of those really quirky pieces from the 19th century isn't it 
Yeah, it really is. I often think that you don't know what you'll find in any corner of our buildings. Mm. So that's from the Kildare Street um, Club, uh, yeah. from history of um, of, of um, our manuscripts um, reading room. And yeah. um, exactly so. So you see these tiny little monkeys playing, playing billiards playing, playing on billiards. the pillars outside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We With a lot of owls as well. You yeah, well, they always find something. Very symbolic, <laughs> but we won't go into that since we're not in the lodge at the moment. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, yeah. uh, were you always in that building? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the library opened um, in 1890. That was a custom built building and um, facing onto the doll, uh, Thomas Dean building. And um, uh, yeah, so but, but our footprint has grown since then. So we're moving up Kildare Street and mm -hmm. um, uh, colonising um, uh, some of the buildings up there. We're also in the National Photographic Archive. So that's in Temple Bar. That's in Temple Bar, yes. Yeah, and we have two new additions over the last few years as well. So um, we're in the Bank of Ireland on College Green, our Seamus mm. Heaney exhibition there. So um, that opened in 20, 2018 um, and beautiful um, space to um, engage with um, the, the Poets Archive, really immersive experience. Sure. And then our very latest um, addition is a partnership with UCD to create Molly or the Museum of Literature Ireland. And that's across Stephen's Green in um, Newman House. Yes, and um, uh, another amazing um, building, you know, uh, something I, just captures uh, you as you walk through the door. Okay, and I could personally uh, praise that one because I was fortunate to get invited to a, uh, a pre-viewing before it opened. And uh, uh, it's a wonder, again, it's a wonderful facility and they've done such an amazing job with uh, the building itself because, um, yeah. I went to UCD when it was in the terrace and uh, Newman House was dishevelled, to put it mildly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just harking back to those days, Sandra, my memory is, is that at the back of where you were used to be the College of Art. Did you take over that uh, section? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is exactly so. So um, the old NCAD building, and we still have echoes of that when we talk about that part <laughs> of our building. Um, so that was a, a, a wing that um, it's from, it dates from 1827. So it's one of the oldest parts. And uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, the College of Art moved out we moved in and mm. what you would find in there now is um, our WB8 exhibition and um, our beautiful um, prints and drawings collections and um, we used to have our seminar room there so yeah very much um, uh, uh, an important part of the library and a vibrant part of the building as well when we're open when we're not at level five COVID-19 restrictions. True. Although everybody would see um, the National Library as a, if you like, a, a hard copy medium in the sense that uh, you've got books, you've got newspapers, a whole range of things. How important has technology become in um, managing your uh, environment? Yeah, that's a really good question, Michael. So this is absolutely, um, I guess, one of the biggest growth areas for us. So um, we say we record the story of Ireland. And nowadays that um, often takes place online. So it might be entirely digital. So if you think of, um, we would have some of the earliest Irish photography, so glass plate negatives and so on. And what does photography look like now? Such an important Indeed. memory of mm -hmm. Irish life. So it's, it's, it's born digital, it's living on your phone, it's living on your iPhone maybe, um, and it has no paper based, you know, you, you might print them out, but it's really a digital object and, and right. that's how it's created. So that's one of the big challenges for um, libraries, national libraries at mm -hmm. the moment, is getting on top of being able to collect and keep safe forever these fragile digital materials. Mm -hmm. And when I say they're fragile, um, maybe the, the, the best way to think of that is um, a website. So we think a website is a really important record of information about Irish life. Now, not all websites, but lots of important websites. It's, say, think of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of government websites. There's websites of organizations that are sharing information and health advice. 
So we want to capture those websites as a record of life in 2020, 2021. But a year later, if you go back to that website, it would the chances are it might be gone altogether or it might be changed so much that you wouldn't recognize it. Indeed. So that's yeah. So collecting that digital material, recognizing that it is an important part of our history in the making collecting it keeping it safe and guaranteeing that you can still access it in a hundred years time that's what we're all about at the moment yep it, just looking at the national library itself before we look at how what you've mentioned the national archives they're in college green they're in molly in uh, um yeah they're in temple bar i think there's even an element of it in collins barracks as well um are is the national library essentially the umbrella organization? Is it a one-stop shop or do you have to go here, there and everywhere to get different information? Could you be, if you like, the first port of call? Well, I think we'd love that and we'd love to welcome people that are looking for information and um, help point them to where that unique source of information might be. And mm -hmm. um, how, so there's a number, as you said, so there's other organisations like the National Archives, the Military Archives, National Museum. So there's organisations that collect different materials and um, uh, often, I suppose, people might be looking for the unique unique material, something very specific or special that they're looking for. And um, it might be in a different institution because that's that collect that's that institutions um, collecting um, you know their remit. So for example, the military archive is a good example because they'd have the records of the military, they'd have um, really important things for family history and for getting a sense of things like the War of Independence, the Civil War and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, those materials would be unique there and if somebody came to us they might start with and have a question about the civil war we could share with them our newspapers our manuscripts um, our, our books and periodicals and then we might say and there are other places you should go to where you'll find other information sure. and uh, so we have this relationship with um, the other uh, collecting institutions and we'd all know I suppose to help somebody and um, get to where they'll find what they're looking for. Sandra, as soon as you're open, I'll probably be down there, uh, you know, uh, picking your brain Brilliant. on that one. Yeah. Something that I hear a lot about, and particularly from visitors to Ireland, invariably from America or Australia, you're essentially the first port of call for genealogy information. Um, how useful and how helpful can the National Library be for people who are uh, interested in, you know, family history and uh, family trees? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is something that can be really close to people's heart, and that's mm -hmm. whether they live in Ireland um, or they live outside. Particularly when they live all elsewhere, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It, I, I think you're right. It becomes yeah. a, a more passionate project, I think, for our diaspora. Mm. So what we would do is we um, um, we uh, would say to get started, um, come to the National Library website when we're open, come through the doors to the Family History Service. Yeah. We have a great range of materials in the National Library that will help you get started and unique materials like the parish records and um, Catholic parish records where if it, so if you if your family tree includes um, baptisms marriages deaths that are recorded in a Catholic parish then you'll find those materials in the National Library and we'd also recommend, uh, as we were saying, um, to go to the National Archives where you'll have the state's records and then, you know, um, also say um, um, other faiths or other, you know, there, there'd be other sources to go to. But I think that we're, we're a good place to get started to. We've a great team um, and uh, they'll get you um, uh, advise you into the process and um, yeah it's something yeah. I think we get really lovely feedback for yeah. it's such a rewarding thing for people to be able yeah. to yeah. Um, trace their family tree yeah can I come back to you on that one because I have a friend and uh, he comes from the Jewish community in Cork although his family were originally in Limerick and we won't go into uh, the issues of why people moved Jewish people moved from Limerick to Cork um, and he, I, I was suggesting he went down the National Archives. Um, 
And an issue that he raised, and it was something I discovered when I went, I was asked to, uh, excuse me, look into the Jewish community in Waterford, which wasn't terribly well known, is that you could go to the local, you, you could go to the library and uh, the county library, you could find the newspapers, but because they were all on microfiche uh, or microfilm, unless you really knew what you were looking for, it was difficult to find. So I, I, was, I said to him, and I, uh, he agreed with me, cataloging is incredibly important when you come to no, any archive. Um, how advanced would you say yours is at this stage? How, are you more to the point, how user-friendly is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, I, I would say it's a blend of um, different technologies at the moment. And the long term goal is exactly as you say, to have all the newspapers digitized so that people can find things easier. But definitely you 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 would be looking at um, using the microfilm machines in the reading rooms. But um, we also have um, Irish newspaper archives. So we have online resources as well. So um, if it depends um you know it's it, it's kind of a um easing yourself into the process and it would depend we mightn't have it digitized we might and the thing yeah. is i suppose to come in and get started yeah, sure. yeah, but it's yeah. absolutely it, exactly as you say that machine readable to be able to yeah. um search archival sources the way we search the internet is the future that's for sure yeah. absolutely yeah no, there's uh, there's digitization and digitization i mean it's one thing to be able to see the image it's another thing to be able to search on keywords which is uh, uh which is the future if if it's not the present yeah. Can I ask you then, the uh, subject we came to talk about is the Irish queer archive. Now, Tony could have called it the Irish gay archives. He could have called it the Irish LGBT archives. But I know Tony, and uh, he made a specific choice to call it the Irish queer archives. Did that raise any eyebrows down in the National Library? Um, so I, I think... Um we would always, so in collecting, and this was a really um, important archive that was community built up. Sure. So I would say it's a principle of um, librarians and archivists to um, respect that knowledge um, that comes with the donor or the creator of the information. We absolutely love like the the provenance the creation of an archive is really important to um respect that and stay true to it mm -hmm. and so um no i would say receiving the archive in the form that it came to us um is really a fundamental um uh, principle of uh, collecting and archiving um, and the director at the time that's um engaso engaso um, I know would have um, uh, like that was a really big deal to um, you know to work with the community to accept um, an archive of that size. It's uh, twenty three cubic meters, very is big. It that, archive. Is it that big? Yeah. Yeah, it really uh, is. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and that would have just been, um, I think, an important moment. And since then, you know, it's a it's a living archive. So we continue to collect mm -hmm. materials related to LGBTI plus and to add to the IQA and our holdings in the area. And um, I mean, that has been marked at the very highest levels of the state. We had um, the Christopher Robson photographic archive mm -hmm. was donated to us in 2015. And that was at an, um, a ceremony officiated by our president, Michael D. Higgins. So, I mean, it's something um, I think, um, you know, maybe that speaks to the importance of the um, the archive, the collecting and having this record in one of our national cultural institutions. Yes, uh, Tony and I have uh, discussed it and uh, we, we both uh, agreed and understood the importance of legacy. Um, uh, because so much of the uh, period that when he, particularly when he started it, it was, it was illegal. Uh, uh, and it was probably medically uh, uh, um, condemned to be LGBT. Uh, and that's why he, Tony has produced this, not for the current generation, but for future generations. And, um, and I think that's the fact that it's now getting an official imprimatur from the National Library is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Tell us then, Sandra, you're, um, you're going to be doing a, you've, you've started last week a series of, it's, I believe it's a year long series of lectures and webinars and talks and things like that. Tell us about that so that we can share that with our listeners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm very uh, delighted about this and excited to be sharing it. So um, we've partnered with Tony Walsh. So Tony has co-curated this series of talks. And I think that's really important because um, like he just knows that that's really important. So Tony has put together this programme of events um, that started last month and runs to the end of the year. The final event will be on World AIDS Day. And what he is doing is um, bringing together really stellar lineup of speakers to cover um, the breadth of conversation that we want to um, uh, make a, a space for, to have all these conversations um, all year. So the topics we opened with um, uh, are one of our own curators, Elizabeth Kirwan, um, speaking about the origins, that what's contained in the Irish Queer Archive. The next Next talk will be uh, in conversation piece with um, Bill Foley and um, Afrikni Creedon, and oh. that's about the living with pride and the Christopher Robson um, photographic collection. Oh. In that's in April, April the twenty eighth. And then in May the 27th, um, we're going to be talking about marriage equality. Mm -hmm. And we have Brian Sheehan and Gronya he Healy and Lisa Connell talking about the journey to marriage equality. That's only six years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I suppose the aftermath of that. And it rolls every month. We'll have a new event covering like um, um, creativity, expression, identity, <sighs> Um, we have a panel discussion on pride, the evolution of pride and, you know, asking questions about the commodification of pride, you know, mm -hmm. it kind of, yeah, so I suppose it's a broad discussion and um, I hope we'll, um, in doing so, we'll be um, having, uh, you know, um, allowing people to talk about things and to come back to the collections that we have in the library and um, to see the place today and your place in history um, and how that has um, changed, how Ireland has um, um, opened up as a society, you know, yeah. If, yeah. if we're not fully there, we're getting there. Yeah. So from either a scholar's or a student point of view, or even an individual point of view, um, how would somebody go about, if you like, perusing the uh, the the uh, the, uh, the collection and the archive? I mean, is it going to be online? Is it going to, or shall once it opens, will people have to go in there and uh, look through some form of catalogue? What's the situation, there, Sandra? Yeah, so I think that's one of the things we really want to get out of this year is an increased awareness for everybody of how they can um, access this material and to offer different ways to be able to engage with it. Mm -hmm. So um, the uh, when we uh, reopen, um, hopefully in May, um, people will be able to access the archive in our reading room. Um, they'll be able to access right now, uh, you can go to the National Library website and our online catalogue and you can browse and enjoy the digitised materials there. And in June, I am really excited to say we're going to be opening a photographic exhibition in the National um, Photographic Archive in Temple Bar. So that will be um, both, uh, I suppose, we don't know how COVID, what access will be possible with COVID at the time. So it will be in the exhibition site. That's our photographic archive, but it will be fully available online. Excellent. So we'll have a 3D um, scan, you know, with um, an immersive experience online of the exhibition. And either ways, that's really important because people will be able to access it from across the world. So you definitely don't need to make the journey to Dublin and um, to um, see that exhibition but um, uh, where we can we're really delighted to welcome people through the door and have that you know when you see these large-scale photographs it's a very um, 
a very evocative experience. You know, you really feel like you're um, immersed in it. Well, so that exhibition is, um, um, Michael, to say a bit more about it, um, it's um, uh, photographs from the Christopher Robson um, collection. And Christopher took these photographs of pride and um, uh, parades and events um, from 1992 to 2007. So they really map the journey of how pride has changed over that time. Like if you think um, in 90, 92, 93, um, as you said, it, um, homosexuality was only decriminalized then. Mm -hmm. So um, that journey from the 90s through to um, 2007 to nowadays, um, like th there's a lot of history over that um, over those decades, and um, Bill Foley um, is our co-curator. So Bill is um, Christopher's um, life partner, and um, he is our co-curator for the exhibition. So um, that's been absolutely invaluable and given us a lot of insights into the photographs that we mightn't have ourselves. Sure. Yeah. Look. Um... The talks you're, uh, you've mentioned, are they go where can people find out about them? Is a schedule going to be uh, put on your website? Or um, um, if you could, certainly if you could send uh, me details, I will share them with our listeners as well, because we uh, have an overseas listenership. So I'd be delighted to uh, yes. get the word out there. So where, where can people go and find out about um, the, uh, the talks, uh, Sandra? Brilliant. And um, so the simplest one is to go to our website, www.nli.ie. And um, everything will be online. So we had to uh, originally we've been um, working on the program with Tony um, to uh, to launch it last year. Um, but COVID got in the way. So this year we've decided to put all the talks online. And um, what that means is exactly as you say, that people can engage with us from overseas. And we're already seeing that with people from around the world. It's fabulous from that point of view. Um, so the details of the talk are there. They'll all be running um, um, each month. You sign up um, they're all free um, and you can register for a ticket online on our website and when we launch the photographic exhibition in June that you'll be able to find that from our website as well and to enjoy it from your sitting room or wherever you are and um, anywhere in the world. Yeah well I don't think people uh, in this country appreciate just how much of a, uh, a shining light we are. Uh, Ireland is seen for LGBT uh, rights particularly since 2015 when we made history. I mean, uh, there's no other way of putting it. So I just want to finish off. Now, you mentioned uh, Chris's photographic exhibition. It goes up to Prides of 2000. I think it was 2007 you mentioned. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. 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 So for somebody like myself, um, who's also been um, creating a parallel section of an archive. Uh, a lot of it is to do with the trans community. And I've got a lot of footage in, uh, and photographs from 2012. If I decided I wanted to do the right thing and offer it to you guys, not saying uh, other, it might be just stuck in a back room, but um, because of its unique nature, uh, not people. There wasn't a lot of coverage of trans issues at the time. How would I go about that? How would other people go about that? Because I've no doubt there are other people out there who've also got some very personal and individual uh, footage. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Michael. So I, I think um, first to say, like our collection span um, the full breadth of LGBTI plus experience. Um, but I think it would be a very welcome addition to the materials we have to add um, uh, trans materials. I think that would be a um, really important um, thing to add to um, the, the, the record um, in, in the national collections. So what I would say is um, what we say is um, first of all, contact us so you can mm -hmm. um, uh, e email and get started on the conversation. Mm -hmm. The process of um, donating um, or, or acquiring a collection, um, I often think it's a um, it's a relationship builder. So we Absolutely. go back and forth with you to understand um, the materials you have in a collection. Um, there's you know um, complexities about if there are materials in the mm -hmm. collection that should be. Um, 
uh, not available for public consultation or if there's um, um, GDPR issues or anything oh, like that. Sure. We'd work through that with the Absolutely. donor. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and the, the important thing I always think is um, get it to a safe home. Um, uh, it will be available for people then. Um, if it isn't today, it'll be in the future, but it's with our country's history. Sure. It's all part of our rich tapestry of life, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Sandra Collins, we're incredibly impressed with what you're doing with this uh, um, uh, uh, exhibition of the, uh, the Queer Archives. We're delighted to have you as a guest today, and we hope to uh, catch you again in the future, and particularly catch you at some of the talks again. So, Sandra Collins, thank you very much for your time today. Brilliant. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. That I want to have a little pride in my world And it's not a place I have to hide in Life's not worth a damn till you can say I am